All right. Well, that just adjusting the camera here. Okay. Utah CCW, howdy, howdy, Jerry, welcome, welcome. Okay, we are live on YouTube, live on Facebook. People are starting to roll in. Mr. Jay Colley, how you doing? Brian, hello. Uh, as you guys come in, whether you, if, if you're on uh, Facebook or if you're on YouTube, you know, go ahead and uh, say hello. Let us know you're here. Mr. Luke Ayer, thanks for jumping in, bud. Ah, <sighs> Mountain Tough. Hello, hello. Anthony Boyd, welcome. Bernie, welcome. Brady, hello. Over the Hill Hunter Jim, hello. Bugle me this. Hello, everybody. Happy, happy, whoppity Wednesday. Uh, Mr. T. Wald, welcome. So, um, I don't know if you guys saw um, kind of what we're going to do tonight. Um, <laughs> Mr. Alex, welcome. Scott, welcome. Freddie, welcome. Glenn, I am here two weeks in a row. Glenn, that's awesome. So, so what we're going to do tonight is I am going to give you guys a couple of hacks on how to add some depth and tonal quality to your calling. So, all right. Welcome to another episode of Wapiti Wednesday Q&A brought to you by Elk Calling Academy. For those of you that don't know, I am Michael Batiste, the owner and founder of Elk Calling Academy. I would like to welcome all of you in. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Elk Calling Academy, um, Elk Calling Academy, we actually have one-on-one -on -one instructional um, classes that we offer to work with people one-on-one. -on -one. We also do Wapiti Wednesday Q&A live where we ask your, you know, we answer your questions, um, kind of give you tips and tricks. So if you're new, if this is the first time tuning in, if you're on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button and click that bell so you're notified whenever we do go live or upload a new video. And for those of you that are on the Facebook page, uh, please be sure to hit uh, like and follow and turn on notifications. So... Okay, we got a few more people jumping in. Mike, welcome. Martin, welcome. Steve Elliott, Scott Schmidt, how you doing, bud? Brad Cantrell, Brad, congrats on your engagement. Uh, I see that my wife has jumped in here tonight as well. So Stephen Elliott, my wife and I are watching together. Perfect. So uh, Stephen, excited to hear how that uh, new read is going to work out for you. So. Okay, let's kind of jump right into it. So, um, Jerry, Mountain Tough cast comes off tomorrow. That's awesome. Jerry, Wampity Wednesday. Justin, nice, nice mount on the bull. Thank you, bud. That's actually this year's bull. That is uh, Pitchfork. Uh, Brian Stone over at Revival Taxidermy did an awesome job on that guy. So, Mr. Robert Gonzalez, Wampity Bob, for those of you that guys that aren't familiar with Robert, uh, go go kind of follow Robert Gonzalez on social media. Um, Wapiti Bob, he is an extremely successful elk hunter. He and his son uh, really have a great approach to elk hunting. Um, father and son, father and son duo that uh, just flat out get it done. Blake Stoker, Dwayne, how you doing? Jeff, welcome, welcome. Where can I get one of your guys' classes. So Jerry, what you can do is over on the Facebook page, you can message me or um, you can message me on YouTube as well. Uh, we can talk about uh, getting you on the class schedule. I have kind of put classes on hold for the next couple of weeks. I do have two students that I'm finishing up, one tomorrow night and one next week. Going to kind of put them on hold for a couple of weeks. So before we kind of jump back into um, some of those, but um, yeah, Jerry, just message me and we can um, chat about it. Or you guys can always email me at Michael, M I C H A E L, at elkcallingacademy.com. We can start the process that way of getting you guys in. So, all right, let's dive into tonight's subject adding depth into your sounds. And, and, and what I mean by this, and there's a couple of little tricks that are really, really hard for you to figure out on your own, but they can really make 
a lot of difference. And I, I, I'm just going to show you an example. Okay, so I'm just going to rip a bugle here one way, and then I'm going to do it the other way so you guys can kind of hear, and hopefully it will come through the audio. So most people... Now, with one or these, these two little tricks, this will add you some depth. And it doesn't matter. So that's on the gray amp right there. Now I'm going to grab the one and a half from Native by Carlton and do the same thing. I don't know how well that's coming across on the microphone. And if you guys could tell on the second one of each of those had a little bit more depth to the bugle, just a little bit more volume. And it's two really simple hacks or tricks that you can do. So the first is where that reed is positioned in the roof of your mouth. So the first bugle, I had this sitting all the way up forward, kind of right behind my front teeth to where I was using kind of out towards, not really on the actual tip of the tongue, back maybe just a half an inch from it, but the fact that the reed is kind of sitting in an angle. On the second one, I moved that back in the roof of my mouth, so it laid more flat like this. Now what happens is when that reed lays more flat like this back towards the back of your mouth, the way that the air goes across that reed and it vibrates it in a different pattern. Now, for some of you that run a reed all the way forward, if you're really struggling to really get a reed to kick up to a high note or you just can't seem to get that high note, try moving it back so that it lays a little flatter. Because like I said, the way the air goes across that latex and the way it vibrates that latex in a different pattern, that's one, one thing that really helps you get to that high note. Now, the second piece of the puzzle is your diaphragm. Using your diaphragm to control the pressure of the air that you're putting over that reed. Where a lot of people fail is they're putting a tremendous amount of pressure with their tongue to try to get that reed to jump up into that high note and the reed almost just stalls out on them. By moving that back and using a combination of just a slight increase with tongue pressure, but also tightening your stomach abs, tightening your rib muscles to press on that diaphragm and force that air out more, the combination of the tongue pressure and the air pressure will help you move that note up. Here's a great drill. Start with light touch and slowly stair step it up. Now what I'm gonna do is each time I stair step this up, I'm increasing tongue pressure just a little bit, but I'm also really pressing on my diaphragm to increase the air pressure on each of these notes and that's what allows me to hold these notes. There's a lot more increase in air pressure on that than there is tongue pressure to get those to step up. That's where you see that when you increase that air pressure and step those notes up, that's how you can hold those notes. And, and it's nice and clean. I mean, you can get up on that high note. And use that air pressure to hold that note a lot easier. So, okay, we've had a lot of things streaming through here. Mr. Jake, how you doing? Casey, hello. Greetings, brother. I love the shadow on your wall from the rack. Thanks for honorable mention. Robert, you bet. Dustin, hello. Garrett Weaver, welcome. Michael, welcome. Jake, how you doing? Lee Cotton, I just tried it and wow, thanks. So Bernie, look at that. Not only are you tuned in, but you're also just putting uh, putting what we're talking about right to, uh, right to work. So that's awesome that you could notice a difference. So, um, you know, just a quick question, you guys that are on here, could you hear the difference between those two bugles? Like I said, I didn't know how well it comes through the microphone. Comment real quick. Let me know if you did hear the difference in those. 
Okay, over on YouTube. Do elk bugle after the rut? Martin, yes, they do. You, you know, elk, elk are pretty... Uh, they're very vocal animals and, you know, bulls will bugle, but primarily they're going to just do location bugles. They are going to keep contact with each other. And that's what that location bugle is for. It's just to keep in contact with each other, know where everybody's at. And that is a bugle that they will do all year round. Now, some of the bugles that you hear during September, you're only going to hear those bugles during September because those are types of bugles and types of aggression that are synonymous with the rut. So they're not going to be doing them throughout the year. But as far as the location bugles, you bet. They will bugle all throughout the year. So, okay. Um, do, 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 do. Yes, slightly. Okay. So you're saying about the pressure. Is it like contracting your stomach muscles? Jeff, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's almost like you're standing up or sitting and you're almost doing a seated crunch how you're engaging those ab muscles and pressing onto that diaphragm. Now, your diaphragm, if you were to take a breath of air and hold it, that's your diaphragm that's trapping that off. Now, you can control your diaphragm to only let a little bit or press on it and let a lot out. That's basically what you're doing. Now, the other thing is once you get this air control down, that's kind of your volume control while you're bugling. We've talked in the past about turning the volume down on your bugles. So your diaphragm and your air pressure is your volume control on that aspect of it. And it takes quite a bit of practice to really get that control of air pressure down. But man, if you can control your air pressure, you're going to notice a huge difference in your calling and in your tones. But the big key with that is moving that read a little farther back. Now, I know a lot of people have just that gag reflex. They just can't do it. As you call on a diaphragm read more and more and more, your, your, your body gets used to it. The amount of saliva that you're producing drops off. You get used to having it in the roof of your mouth. So you can slowly start moving that thing back. And it's just small increments that I'm talking about to train the body to be comfortable with that. You don't want to just take it from the front and immediately throw it all the way in the back. I can guarantee you're probably going to gag on it. Now, I've had a couple of you ask about the shower, the spray, the spitting, the saliva. The more you have a reed in your mouth, the more that does subside. It does go away with time. And in fact, a good thing that you can do is you can just take a reed and just put it right in your cheek move it to the roof of your mouth, move it back, get your body used to it being in there. What's happening is the reason your body's producing so much saliva is up to this point, all that you've stuck in your mouth is food. So your brain and your body's immediately thinking they're putting food in my mouth. We need to start hitting it with the saliva and the acids and start the digestive process. The more you call on it and the more you have the reed in your mouth, the body's going to finally all of a sudden go, mm this isn't food and it does subside. So, okay. Stephen Elliott, thanks for all the good info. You bet. Scott, I could tell the difference right away. I always do do when you tell us new stuff and yes, I could hear the volume. Okay, good. Bernie, appreciate that. Um, I trim the back of my reeds to, pre to prevent the gag reflex. Scott, you, you certainly can. Um, the one thing about trimming the back, I caution on you, don't trim too much. Um, you know, you certainly can. Um, you you certainly can, you know, trim the sides. And in fact, we do have a video on the YouTube channel of you know how to tune a diaphragm read to fit. So um, definitely go check that out. Okay, we've got quite a few coming through in YouTube. Okay, called in and saw my first Rosie five by five to twenty eight yards. Had four chances to draw my bow and choked, could not get my cams to roll over. That is something that happens all the time. It's funny how that adrenaline really kicks in and you just can't draw your bow. Um, I, I hear of that happening all the time. In fact, a lot of guys make fun of me because I've kind of switched to either a 60 or a 65 pound bow. Uh, with the equipment that's on the market nowadays with the kinetic energy, the speeds, everything that you're getting in those combinations, 
I know there's a huge push to go to 80 pounds or this or that. My question is, 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 is when you get in awkward situations, which you sometimes do elk hunting, are you going to be able to draw that? So draw what you feel comfortable with. You send me. Okay. Yeah. Steven, I did send you the link on how to tune that read. So, okay. I use the gray amp works best for me with no teeth and I hate my dentures. Um, a lot of people that have dentures, you know, struggle, um, Jim with using diaphragm reads. So yeah, some of them will just take the top dentures out. So yeah. And the gray read that is a, uh, the gray amp is a, is, is a good read. Almost had the same thing happen to me, OTH Hunter. No clue why, but it happens. Yeah, it's something about the adrenaline not being able to um, draw. I don't know. It's just weird. Just got in. Sorry, I missed it. Steven, you're fine. Sure did. Sounded good. Yep, 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 yep. Yes. Okay, you guys were able to hear the difference. Good. Thanks for the information. I'm new to calling, and Ben Munoz told me to check you out. Uh-oh. Chris, I don't know if I'd be running around saying that uh, you know or associated with that Ben Munoz character. So no, Ben's, Ben's a great guy. Welcome. So is this like adding emotion to your calling? It's, it's not really adding emotion. It's, it's adding depth and realism, you know, to your calling. Cause if you, you know, if you're really out there and you're really listening to bulls, you know, they, they just, they, they have a depth to their, to their calling, to their sound. Same thing with, with cows. Um, that's why we have to use, you know, little tools like the game changer or, you know, a, a grunt tube to help us get some of that depth and, and amplification so that we can uh, really imitate and emulate, you know, the elk that we're trying to um, come across as. So um, second rut calling, same as first rut, post rut calling. Um, yeah, Dustin, the, the, the rut's the rut. I mean, the second rut, you know, you're still um, kind of doing, you know, the breeding sequence. You, you're still acting like a bull that has a hot cow. The intensity or the amount of responses that you're getting from bulls may not be the same. And really a lot of times when you're coming into that second rut or that second cycle, you know, the bulls are really, really efficient at breeding the cows during that first rut. So, really about this time, those, those, those big mature bulls have already broken off from the herd and kind of gone back into solitude. So you, you primarily just have, um, kind of those, those satellite younger bulls, which in some areas, I remember the year we hunted Montana, those, those satellite bulls were three twenties, three thirties. So not, uh, not bad bulls at all. Um, I posted a picture. Um, I can't remember if it was earlier today or yesterday of my buddy, Mark, um, he talked to me a couple of days ago. He was just getting ready to head up uh, head up north here in Idaho on a rifle elk hunt with his daughter and son-in-law. And we kind of talked about strategy and, and you know, reports that I've been getting of elk activity and what's still going on and kind of some practices, you know, that he may try up there. And, you know, one thing I kind of told him was, um, you know, I've talked to you guys about it, just kind of get in a place and set up and do two or three soft cow calls, wait four or five minutes, do it again. Um, he did that. And within a one hour period, they called in two bulls and put both of them on the ground. So calling is still effective right now. It's just matching your surroundings, being realistic about it and, you know, matching what's going on around you, paying attention to what's going on. Don't, don't overdo it. So, uh, Glenn minus set at 63.1. I can pull it back standing on my head. Perfect. Been there. That mouth goes dry once that animal comes into play fever time, or is it just me? No, it's, it's, you know, the mouth will go dry sometimes. It's, it's just one of those things that, you know, emotion or excitement. Um, sometimes it's nervousness that can, uh, you know, dry out the mouth a little bit. So definitely it, it, it does happen. So especially if you're hiking, huffing up the hill, trying to get into position, you kind of get caught off guard by a bull. You can certainly get dry mouth and really fight to uh, get some saliva to make that work. So, all right, back over to YouTube. Okay. Looks like I missed another good one. Steven, we're just getting going. Bugle me this gagger. 
some people it does happen. Some people they have to run that read all the way forward. So it's just how it is. Okay, so so those of you that really have that really bad gag reflex and you can't necessarily move that read that far back, even if you just move it back a little bit, but then really slide your tongue forward so that your tongue really lays flat on that read. Um, I mean, most of that really comes from that read laying flat and the way the air is going across it. But there are things that you can do with it all the way forward that you can still get some really good tones. You can still do the air control. You can still control your step ups. You can still control your expansion. You can still control your volume because that is all with your diaphragm. The only thing is, is you might have to work a little bit harder to really get that read to step up to um, the high note. There's there's some note there, there's some reads on the market now today that I can actually get shoot a six note octave out of those things can really really step them up and make them sing. So I uh, got six bulls going this year and three of them and using your tricks mountain tough. That's awesome. That's I love hearing stuff like that right here. Garrett Weaver's in here. Perfect. I dropped my weight to 62 pounds for that reason. I'm working on that being realistic. Okay. Starting out with the Primos Mini helped me. Perfect. Okay. Um, are chuckles still effective this time of year? Yes, they can be. So, but what type of chuckles? You know, again, Scott, pay attention to kind of what you're hearing. Usually a lot this time of year, I focus more on cow sounds than I do bugling. Um, look at that. We talk about uh, we talk about Mark and his success and the tips and and now he pops in. Mark Santo, welcome, brother. We were just talking about your uh, your hunt. So um, but yeah, Scott, you 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 really want to match what's what's going on around. I mean, if you hear some bulls firing off, go ahead and fire off. Like I said, I focus more on the cow sounds this time of year because um, usually, honestly, this time of year, I'm more involved with cow hunts. And so I want to play on that maternal instinct. Um, but if you do have that bull tag, don't think that that just doing these cow sounds that that I'm talking about is not going to call in a bull. I mean, shoot, Mark's a prime example of it. They sat there an hour and did exactly what uh, what I was talking about two bulls in an hour. So it certainly can happen. And I have heard from a lot of people that, that it does seem like the rut has been kicking lately, especially, you know, last week. So, which kind of falls right in the line with everything that, uh, you know, we saw this archery season where I never really saw a true peak rut activity. Plus the amount of fat that was on my bull now with kind of the reports I'm getting, I think we're going to be in for a pretty good winter, guys, in a lot of areas. Now, this this isn't the case everywhere because, you know, I've talked to other people in some other states that the bulls were flat out ripping and doing their normal thing. And, and, and that's the thing to remember and keep in mind is the severity of the winter can vary from area to area and from state to state. And it can, even within your state, the east side of the state versus the west side of the state or north, that winter can vary even within your own state. You can have one area that has a mild winter, but another one has an, an, an extremely above normal snowfall. Um, again, that's why... You know, when I'm really trying to figure out or try to guess, you know, you know, do my best guess of, of when the rut's really going to be kicking, you know, that's why I really look at that farmer's almanac and the winter predictions, you know, doing the Google search along with, you know, the full moon and all that stuff. Um, for those of you guys that may not have watched that video uh, on the YouTube channel, we do have, uh, you know, a, a video how to figure out the best week to hunt each year might just pop in and, and, and watch that. It kind of gives some pretty good tips on um, how to narrow down some of those. So 
All right, YouTube. The elk hunt was a huge bust due to the weather. We were snowed in and socked in most of the time. The best part for me and my son was we did have a bull bugle back and forth eight times. Yeah, Scott, I saw your pictures. Um, definitely looks like you guys did get hammered with weather. But like you and I talked about those memories that were built with you and your son, um, you know, that to me sounded like an extremely successful hunt for the two of you. And those are memories that you're going to hang on to for the rest of your life. And your son's going to hang on to them also. Uh, you know, the first time of, of hearing a bull bugle out in the wild is just, it, it's just something you never forget. Um, I don't care how many bulls you hear bugle, how many years you do it. It, it, it just, that first one always resonates with you, especially when they get in close or multiple times and you feel it and the emotion and the excitement and the adrenaline. It's just, I, I, I'm just, I'm happy for you guys. I, I think you guys had a, had a great time. So Brady got to cut it short tonight, but we'll watch later. Thanks for the info. You're welcome, Brady. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Uh, absolutely. His grandkids are going to hear about his first hunt. LOL. That is, that is perfect. So uh, ta, 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 ta. uh, Steven, does calling change come late season or does it just die before mid November? Yeah, calling does kind of, kind of die down into that post rut and kind of that staging time, getting ready for their winter migration. Um, really once, once the peak rut actually hits and the peak rut starts tapering off, um, the bugling activity, um, or, or, or calling, I guess you would say kind of starts tapering off the cows and calves will still do their everyday communication. They'll still do their mews and chirps, but as, but as far as, you know, the bugling, um, it, it may just, you know, like I talked earlier about, it may just be down to, you know, just those random location bugles of saying, Hey, where's, where's everybody at? You know, you're, your good, nasty, guttural lip balls and those type of bugles are going to be few and far between. Because um, really, the, the elk at this point, you know, most of the cows have been bred. Now they're focused on really, you know, packing on pounds, especially the bulls. They're, they're trying to bulk back up from everything that they lost during the winter. <clears throat> you know, maybe maybe heal up from some of the wounds they got from the rut. I mean, the rut is hard on bulls. I mean, they will drop a lot of body weight and they are just beat up. So right now their main focus is just, you know, packing on, packing on weight so that they can survive the winter. Um, especially if, if it's going to be a hard winter coming up. So, <coughs> sorry guys. All right, Jay, you doing class in November, thinking about my class the first week of November. Jay, yes. Um, so like I said, I'm gonna, gonna kind of ramp up or, or really get back into it kind of November 1st. So just, just get a hold of me. Schedule's pretty open. So we can talk about a uh, number of classes, get you on there and uh, get you going. So the other thing that I am considering is about switching everybody over to Zoom video conferencing, even even those guys that live here local. I just I think it's a great tool. Um, plus, you get a recording of the lesson, something that you can go back and watch over and over and over again. If it is one of those things that we're just having a really difficult time during the video conference, then you know we'll schedule a time to meet face to face for those of you that live local. Um, but yeah, I am. I am considering still thinking about that. I'll I'll, I'll make the announcement um, probably first of first of November here in a couple of weeks. Stephen called in a satellite bull within seventy yards second week of September, and a lot of cows never never sealed the deal, but had more interactions with elk this year than any other year, all because of your lessons. That is why we do it right there hearing those type of things. I mean, that to me is a success. Was a tag punched? No, but the interactions and all that, you saw an increase of it. You, you, you got into situations that in the past may have dropped the ball that now were successful for call-ins. That is all part of the learning and the growth process. So, um, but 
I love hearing things like those. Bugle me this. Zoom worked great for our lesson. Yeah, Zoom is a, a great tool. So, Scotty Brown, how you doing, bud? Okay, Scott, so a lost calf call will work to bring in a cow during November archery. Yes, absolutely. So, like I said, Scott, that's that's playing on that maternal instinct, um, you know, of those cows. Um, they don't know what's going on with that calf. They don't know if it's one of their own that just got separated or what. But but yes, playing on that maternal instinct of the cows uh, is is a highly, highly effective tool. So Steve and I was more focused on cow calls. I don't think I've ever heard a bugle later than early October. Yeah, yeah it's 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 not that much. So um, and, and and remember too that you know those the, those bulls that came and, and and became part of the cows or came down and got with the cows during September and during the rut. A good majority of those bulls are still going to stay with those cows and migrate with those cows to the wintering ground. Um, your, your really large dominant bulls that are used to used to kind of being on their own anyways, that are used to solitude, those are the guys that are going to break off. But the other bulls are going to stay there with the cows. So, you know, we've, we've all heard it and we've all seen it. Where the cows go, the bulls go. So if 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 you're sitting there and you're doing you, you know these these uh, lost calf sounds or distressed calf, and you're playing on that maternal instincts, and the cows start start coming, the bulls that are with that group are going to come too. So for those of you guys that are doing late season rifle hunts, that can be an advantage and it can be an effective tool to use as well. Again, I've I've said this before. If you are going to be out there calling during a rifle hunt, please make yourself visible. So we, we've heard too many horror stories of people just shooting at a sound in the brush. So make yourself visible, protect yourself, be safe. So Maddie Lux, how you doing, bud? Christina Chapman, welcome. Christina, congratulations on your Wyoming antelope. That is awesome. Looks like you guys dealt with some, uh, pretty, pretty harsh conditions. So, all right. Other things that we have in the mix right now, right now I have 13 diaphragm reads that Mark from Native by Carlton sent over. A couple of them are reads built kind of on specs that I asked for. A couple of them are reads that he's been playing with. We have started the process um, to kind of join forces and come up with a couple of new reads within the Rip It lineup for the 2019 series. We also are starting to collaborate on a new grunt tube for 2019 as well. Of these 13 diaphragms or 12 diaphragm, there's 12 or 13. Of these diaphragms that I have, there are a couple that are... Um, starting to really stand out. So I think we're to that point of now we kind of just start making some fine tweaks on them. Um, Maddie Lux, got anything with a deep sounding cow? Um, Matt, that's actually one thing that, that, that's one of the reads that I'm really working on with them is something with kind of that good depth of tone, almost like the Marco produces on the cow sounds and still have the ability to get some good depth tone on the bugles as well. Um, for those of you on the Facebook page, um, you know, really, really appreciate your guys' input on what you're looking for in a read. Definitely Mark and I have been discussing those. Really what we've been hearing from a lot of people is a good all-around read that has good control, good tones, ease of use, um, they already have a couple, like I said, the 450 and the one and a half were two reads in the Rip It series that, uh, I used probably 99% of the time this archery season because they already do have those. Now we're just kind of, kind of trying to expand and get some, some better, um, or, or some different depth, some different tones, um, some different stacks. So, cause we realize that everybody's a little bit different. The other thing that we've heard from a lot of you guys is a good single read, good all around, good control. So just know, guys, we're, we're hearing you. 
we do pay attention to what you're saying. We do pay attention to the comments. So um, those of you guys that are, uh, you know, on the YouTube page, um, you know, go ahead in the go ahead in the comment section here during this live Q and A. Let us know what you look for in a read. You know, if if you were to have the perfect read, what would it entail? You know, is it a single? Is it a one and a half? Is it a double? Um, you know what? What do you look for in a read? So, because guys, that's that's what we're trying to produce. It's one thing to come up with reads that I can use or that Mark can use or this or that, but really, we want a read that you guys can use. You know, and some of the discussions that we've had is, you know, because one thing that comes up a lot is longevity. Here's a good rule of thumb, guys. For every seven to 10 day hunt, have three or four reads for that time frame. And that's three or four reads that you have taken out of the package, you have tuned, you have broken them in, you have called on them. They are ready to go because things happen out there. Um, in fact, we were talking about this. How many times have you guys been sitting there, you stop for a break during the day to eat a sandwich, you get done, you get up and you start moving and all of a sudden you realize that you left your read sitting on a log back there where you were eating lunch. That's why you carry three or four. And because you typically are bugling a lot more or calling a lot more on a read during the season, reads will wear out a little bit faster. Tricky question I've got, how long should a read last? There's a lot of variables that go into that. You know, how are you taking care of the reeds? You know, are you throwing them in a in an airtight container and not letting them dry out? Are you putting them in the direct sunlight? Um, how much acid do you have in your saliva? It really varies from person to person to person. But like I said, a good rule of thumb is three or four diaphragm reeds for a seven to 10 day hunt. So. All right. Um, there's that. Jay Colley, congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. My wife ordered the green amp read earlier. Thanks again, man. Looking forward to spitting all over myself until I figure out how to tune it. Yeah, Stephen, like I said, go to the YouTube channel, watch the Beginner's Guide to Elk Calling, and also watch that How to Tune a Diaphragm read, and those will really help you get going um, down the path, the right direction. And then I know you talked about getting on a, on a video chat, play with those things first. Then we can certainly talk about getting online and kind of expanding. So, uh, Lucas, it's a great read. I couldn't bugle worth a darn. Got myself a green amp read on Mike's advice and I'm getting a handle on it. Then now Lucas, that's awesome. Scott Reed, I blew, or, or Scott, I blew out three reads in 17 days. It, it, exactly. So that's why I really say carry multiple reads with you and, and multiple of that same read, the one that you like. So I carry multiple different reads with me. So um, like the 450, the one and a half, I had four of each of those. I had two or three of each of the amps. So just so that I had multiple, it's just like going fishing. You're, you're not, you're not just going to take one thing when you go fishing, you're going to take a few different things. So, but you definitely have your favorites that you fall back in. All right. YouTube, the perfect bull. Okay. Benito, I'm using Rocky mountain hunting calls, raging bull and trophy wife. They sound pretty different. The raging bull is high pitched and the trophy wife is nasally. Am I blowing them right? So basically what you what you have there, Benito, is is two different reads that are built with specific things in mind. And, and, and what I mean by that is is the raging bull is kind of built on a good all around read, something that, you know, you can do cow sounds, you can bugle on. It is built more for the bugling side of it. And then the trophy wife on that flip side is, is built more as a cow call. So you have different thicknesses of latex, you have different stretches, and they are going to respond differently, and you are going to get different tones out of them. Just like different guys in your group, you, there may be four of you in the group, you all four are using um, you know, the raging bull and the trophy wife, but the four of you sound completely different on the read. Neither of you sound the same. 
that's just how it goes. The roof of our mouths are shaped different. The way that our air travels across the reed, it's different. But from what you're telling me there, it, it sounds like you're blowing them right. That that trophy wife is designed to have a more nasally resonance on the bottom end on it. So uh, lost cow sounds might help from here on then. Yes, lost cow sounds would be a, or, or lost, lost calf, lost cow would be a, um, Good idea for this time of year. Jay, how do you tune a reed? Okay. So, so basically what you're doing when you tune a reed is, 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 is you're taking a reed and everybody's a little bit different. So there's things that you can do to tune a reed. First thing is you can take your fingers and you can put it right on the bottom of the horseshoe. And then you take your thumbs and you put it up on the top and you can put a little bit of bend on that. So that way it curves to the roof of your mouth. If you're a person that likes a reed that has a bend to it, me personally, I like a nice flat reed. So if I can feel my reed starting to bend, I'm going to do the opposite and I'm going to flatten that thing back out. The other way to tune a reed is when you put a reed in the roof of your mouth and you have a lot of tape that's hanging down like this, or maybe this tape is down hanging below your teeth. What you can actually do is you can take a pair of scissors and you can trim the sides. Now, if you're going to start cutting the sides, start with just a little bit because you can always cut off more if you need to cut a little bit more off of it. But if you go too far, you can't put tape back onto it. So that's what basically tuning a reed is. It's, it's trimming the tape and shaping the frame so that it sits up in the roof of your mouth and you get the best seal possible. And everybody's a little bit different on what they're gonna do. Now, the other thing that I recommend with reeds, when you first take a reed out of the package, most of us just wanna grab that reed, pop it in our mouth and start trying to do cow sounds. And if it doesn't do cow sounds, what's the first thing that we do? We talk, take it out and go, that reed's garbage and we throw it away. Any new read that I get, as soon as I take it out of the package, the first thing I do is I rip 15 to 20 good hard bugles on it. I want to get that latex nice and settled. I want to get it set. And the thing that you're going to find is by ripping those bugles and getting everything to relax a little bit, then when you go to make your cow sounds on it, it's going to respond a lot better to your cow sounds. You're going to have a much better control. So that reed that you popped in and tried to do a couple of cow sounds on it wouldn't do it and you thought it was garbage. You rip those bugles on it, then you pop it back in and do some cow sounds. It may be the sweetest cow sounding reed you've ever used. That kind of goes along with some of the other feedback that we've had about longevity. And I asked the question, would you rather A, have a reed that right out of the package will do any sound that you want but it's not going to last as long or B a read that maybe you have to take out of the package, rip a few good hard bugles on before it will do what you want, but last a little longer. I'm kind of amazed because everybody is saying they would rather have that read right out of the package, do exactly what they want and be able to produce all the tones, even though it's not going to last as long. It's part of that instant gratification process. So I encourage you guys, though, when you try new reeds, rip bugles on it first. The other thing with ripping bugles on it is you're immediately going to know how that reed's going to respond to pressure. Do you have a reed that's built for heavy pressure or do you have a reed that's built for light pressure? Those are things that you need to know because each reed and how it's built is going to act differently in the way it responds to light pressure, heavy pressure, this or that. So pretty much just um, play around with them. So, okay, that's pretty much what it is. Great advice, fishing, you bet. Jay, thank you, you're welcome, bud. Uh, ta -ta 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 back over on YouTube. Mike, if you had one read to use, which would it be? So, okay, Jerry, I really like a one and a half. OK, the reason I like a one and a half and what a one and a half is, is it's a full bottom layer, but that top layer is only a half read. 
meaning so so this is basically a one and a half right here it might be kind of hard to see where this layer only comes part way up but usually on my one and a half i like that half read to be on the top and this is why i really like a one and a half because it, it gives me the ability to play the front part just that long read i can play that front part for my cow sounds but then when I start adding the extra pressure of bugling, I have that half read that now all of a sudden gives me the support, gives me the backbone of that read to be able to handle a little bit more pressure on my bugles. So um, I also think with the one and a halves, you, you have the ability to get some reads that have some, you know, good deep tones on the, on the cow side of it but also have that backbone support strength that you can really get into it that if you really get into a bull and and and, and you know you're just you're just doing this short aggressive high pitch snappy bugle that you know you're basically calling him some not so nice names for me personally that's why I like a one and a half so but everybody is a little bit different so okay can you bugle on the reed without the tube yeah um So yeah, you certainly can do it. I mean, really, the the purpose of a tube, all a tube is, is 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 it's a megaphone. It's an amplifier. It helps us get more volume. It helps accentuate those bottom ends. That's really the purpose of a, a of a grunt tube, and that's that's basically all it's there for. So Stephen, now I'm going to have to order myself a Phelps tube. So Glenn, I've been having fun with different reads. I'm driving my wife crazy. Thank God she likes elk meat. Perfect. That's awesome. Can you please demo a read estrus call? So, okay, Jerry, this is this this is where, and I've talked about this, you know, in the past. Um, me personally, I don't think there really is a estrus call, uh, meaning I don't think a cow really makes a sound when she comes into estrus. So. Um, Here's a, here's a good way to think about it about it with with deer, you know when a when a doe is is an estrus does she ever stand up and make a sound, or is it that she just stands up she squats and pees the buck smells those pheromones, and then he breeds her. Same thing with elk. I think what you're kind of talking about is is that buzz mew, so that. <coughs> To me personally, I think that's more of a sound that they're doing to stand out and demand attention because I have heard this. I, I, I've heard cows do this outside of the rut. I've heard them do it in June. And so that's why I don't think it's just an, it, just an estrus call. I think it's more of a of a tone that's demanding attention. That's, you know, pay attention to me now. So um but that's basically what it is, the buzz mew. So I was going to add read plus GC is not a bad combination. No, the, the game changer is a great, great tool to have. So that was cool. I made my bugle tube out of a kid's wiffle ball bat. Works like a charm. Matt, yes, it does. Um, and in fact, next week, I'm going to be talking about that. I'm going to be talking about back pressure and why back pressure is... Um, an advantage when calling. And sometimes um, for beginner callers, when they try to make their own tube out of a wiffle ball bat, they sometimes get that hole too big. And so the air really floods out and it, and it has nothing. If, if you really want to experience back pressure, this game changer right here. That's what exactly what this call was designed for, to give you back pressure. Play with it. See how that back pressure affects your calling. See how well you can hold your notes. See how well it helps you transition on your notes. So 
as you become more efficient caller, you learn to develop and build your own back pressure. But when you're first starting out, that's where tubes that have good back pressure are a huge benefit. So uh, just got a phone with my buddy. They put two more elk on the ground tonight. They're still bugling in Colorado. Dwayne, that's awesome. Yeah, I've heard they're still bugling in uh, quite a few areas. Robert Gonzalez, I agree. You're playing. Thank you. You bet. Okay. Uh, back over to YouTube. Had a couple of more pop in. Um, oh, we had a bunch pop in. Okay. Steven, definitely like the mellow yellow for calling and use the Reaper by Rocky Mountain for bugling. Black Magic from Rocky Mountain works great. Yeah, the Black Magic is is a good all-around call from Rocky Mountain hunting calls as well. Mellow Yellow Mama sounds so good. Mountain Tough, if I can get a reed to last, I want it. Had some reeds wear out fast while working bulls over here this season. And, and, and yeah, guys, I mean, reeds are going to wear out. It, it just... It's a nature of the beast. We're talking about latex that is affected by acid and heat and sunlight and, and, you know, really thinking that you're going to get one read to last the whole entire season. I mean, you could, but in reality, it's, it's not a real realistic expectation. So, um, okay. Love the raging bull. Yeah. The raging bull has been a great read and has been, the top seller for Rocky Mountain hunting calls for a lot of years. In fact, the Raging Bull was what I used mostly the whole time that, you know, I was with Rocky. So, uh, bought the Elk Magic second to the last day of season. And by the time we harvested that six on the last day, it was torn. So, can you recommend a tube to use with the Raging Bull? You know, Benito, there's there's a lot of good tubes on the market. Um, you know, the Unrivaled and the Unleashed from Phelps, the Wapiti Whacker from Rocky Mountain, um, the Golden Tone Grunt Tube from Barry Game Calls. Um, you know, uh, Native by Carlton has a Wolf Ball Bat style that has a turned mouthpiece that is really, really comfortable to call on. So... There, I, I do have some videos on the YouTube, um, both last year and this year. I did the 2017 and the 2018 Grunt Tube Challenge. So if you want to watch the Grunt Tube Challenge and watch the results video, so that way you can hear what those tubes sound like. And then basically just pick a tube that kind of is producing the sounds that you're kind of wanting to produce and also the size of what you want to carry because there's different factors. And, and like I said, next week, we're going to talk about grunt tubes. We're going to talk about the different shapes, the different sizes, the advantages, disadvantages, um, benefits of them. So all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to dangle that carrot in front of you guys right there. Next, next week, we're going to talk about grunt tubes. So, okay. Um, I must be doing it wrong because I've yet to run through a read and my wife could tell you, I probably practice too much. Uh, elk team six. Now can you bugle without the read? LOL. Not very effectively. So Rocky mountain Wapiti Whacker tube is designed for back pressure as well. Worked great for me. Yes. That one does have good back pressure. Uh, love the Wapiti Whacker just learning and helps me sound way better than I am. So, all right. Uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. Sweet, I'll tune in. Great advice. Took me a few prototypes to get the hole the right size. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's the one thing there is determining that size. So work on developing your own techniques. So um, what Robert's talking about there is 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 playing with your own techniques because our own the the shape of our mouth, the way our tongue contacts the reed, and the and the way the air pressure. Or, or the air flows across that reed is, is really different for, you know, person to person. So really what he's talking about there, working on developing your own techniques is where that reed is in the roof of your mouth and how your tongue is contacting that. And it's, it's basically, um, it's, it, it's a combination that you really have to play with to find the best maximum effort for you. 
So a lot of you guys may not run that read as far back as, as, as I like to run it um, just because that's not your optimum position uh, for me. It is. So that's why a lot of times I'll say, once you start calling, start moving that read forward and back to find that place and then sliding your tongue forward and back on it to get that, you know, get that good seal, the diaphragm with the air pressures, um, but really play with those different combinations and see how that depth of tone is changing. So Freddie, have a good night, bud. Glenn, good night, boys. Body is out of gas, been up since 11 p.m. Glenn, Glenn, good night. Thanks for tuning in, guys. So, all right. Ooh, we got Lewis Shelter and Charlie Smith both tuning in. Hey, guys. So, okay. Um, so, we kind of talked about uh, next week with, um, you know, grunt tubes. Uh, we're going to talk about flared in. We're going to talk about small in. We're going to talk about wolf of ball bat style. We're going to talk about some of the smaller tubes, flexible tube, non-flexible tube. Um, just kind of talk about the benefits of, of, of each one, the pros and cons to kind of help you guys kind of narrow that down. So if you guys have any questions, this is the last round for questions coming in before we shut it down tonight. Um, I definitely do appreciate, you know, each of you guys tuning in, um, you know, following us, love the support. So hopefully, you know, tonight's kind of little tidbits about how to get kind of some depth into your calling is helpful. I know a couple of you um, talked about that you tried it right here, right here when we're, you know, online and, and, you know, it kind of worked. So keep playing with it. So, um, I'm or okay, so not seeing much questions rolling in. So I guess we are. I'm out. See you next week. Good night. Bugle me. Good night. Thanks for uh, tuning in. So we're going to shut this down, guys. We're approaching the hour mark. So again, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Appreciate the support. Wouldn't be able to do this without all of you. So as always, keep calling, keep practicing, but most importantly, have fun. We will see you guys next week on the next episode of Wapiti Wednesday brought to you by Alt Calling Academy. Have a great night, everybody.